question. If these are yours, can you please collect them right now? Is this anyone's bracelet? Is it yours? So, morning everyone. So hopefully you all had a good night's sleep. This is only day two, so we still have a really big day ahead of all of us. So global village meetings and workshops are still gonna be continued all throughout today. Um, however, we also have a, uh, um, a panel of change makers and more information will be given to you throughout the day. Um, um, a reminder that the Change Makers Dinner is tonight. Um, so if you brought a change of clothes, you have between 6 and 6.30 to get change. And at 6.30, um, you're required to meet with your advisors and it'll be in the courtyard where we had dinner last night. And then from there, we'll take shuttle buses to Coral Beach where the venue is. Um, also, just, just like final reminder, can we please leave the places that you go to cleaner than you found them? Last night, a lot of bottles were scattered throughout the dinner area, and um, I was just like what, hoping that you guys could just be a little more mindful about the workers that clean up after you, and so please clean up after yourselves. Even though if you see something that isn't necessarily yours, can you just throw it away or ask one of us to help you out if, if there's a recycle bin? Um, so also with water bottles, um, if you're provided one earlier on in the day, please have that with you on at all times and refill them with the water coolers that can be found all throughout campus. That way um, we can uh, minimize the use of plastic throughout this conference and then that way you don't have to continuously ask us for water bottles. So yeah, thank you. So after those announcements, we can now start with the first event of the day. And I am today I am Mr. introducing Mr. Matthew Hayden, who is the director of the recycler company here in Tanzania. He's gonna talk a bit about what he does and how his work kind of links the theme, our theme of Tuam Kono. Thanks. Good morning, are you guys tired? No, you're wide awake? All right, good. I'm going to talk today about finding purpose and happiness. Do you guys want to be happy? Yeah? That's good. Me too. So I'm going to go through a few things that might make you happy and might help you find purpose, and we'll see how it goes. So first, what makes people happy? A lot of people say that money makes you happy. Does money make you guys happy? Uh, okay. Well, let's see. What research says about money is you actually do need a little bit of money to be happy. But basically, if you make around $35,000 a year uh, per person, every additional money you make doesn't make you happy. So you don't need to be a millionaire to be happy. You don't need to be a billionaire to be happy. If you, have a, if you go to, to college and you're a professional, chances are you will make the maximum amount of money to get the maximum amount of happiness out of that. So, so money can make you happy if you cover your basic services, but it doesn't make you happy the most money that you could possibly have. So there's no point in being a millionaire or a billionaire, because that isn't going to actually make you happy. All right? What about, what about social media? Does social media make you guys happy? No? Yes? <laughs> so the truth of the matter is that every time you get a notification or a like or a, one of those heart things on Instagram, um, it does release a type of dopamine. Um, dopamine is the same type of thing that when you eat a piece of chocolate or you go for a run or you get a massage. It releases that kind of dopamine to your brain. And that makes you happy for a small amount of time. And the problem with social media is that it keeps making you come back and back um, to get that release of dopamine again. And it can cause issues like anxiety, depression, um, things like this if you're always going back to your phone to try and get that release of dopamine. So think about that. It's a bit of a problem, isn't it? <laughs> so what really makes people happy? Does anyone have any idea? What do you think makes people happy? Just shout it out. What? Pets? I like that. That's cute. <laughs> Alright, so there are two main things that research says again and again that makes us happy. And the first is community. 
It's about being in a community, helping out in the community, um, being close to others. It not only makes you happy, but it also makes you live longer and makes you healthier as a person. All across the board, these are really good things for you. Um, some research goes as far as to say that you have a 15% chance of uh, less of dying if you have a good community around you at any age. So it's really good for making you happy, and it's really good for also helping out in the community. And the other thing is this idea of purpose. So it means that you need to have meaningful work. Um, you need to be doing something that you feel is meaningful to yourself. So rather that is taking care of animals um, or whatever, it needs to be meaningful for you, and you need to find a way to find that purpose. So for me, there are many different types of per things that are challenges that exist in the world today. There's climate change, inequality, animal welfare, human health care, reducing poverty. And any of these are really worthy purposes that you can choose. You can choose, you know, you, maybe your meaningful life is looking after your family. Um, any of these are good as long as they're meaningful to you. So I'm going to talk a bit kind of what I've chosen and how that makes me happy um, and, and explain it to you kind of how it works, right? So I've kind of looked into climate change because I see it as one of the biggest issues that is facing our, on our generations. Um, if you look at the, the number of deaths caused by different things, so here you have, um, on the far right, you have smoking, kills 6.2 million people a year. That's a lot. You probably shouldn't smoke. Um, you have malnutrition and, uh, and undernourishment, kills about 3.1 million people a year. Car accidents, kills 1.2. Uh, you know, conflict, war, violence, kills half a million people a year. Um, but then on the very far left, you see total pollution. And pollution kills more people than tuberculosis, malaria, HIV AIDS every year. Around 8.8 .8 million people die because of pollution. This is polluted water, polluted soil, polluted air. All these things uh, add up to a very big problem. Um, and there's more statistics from the World Health Organization that says this is a big issue. At the same time, I also really like animals. I know you had Brittany come and speak to you yesterday. Um, and the fact is that, to be honest, we're killing off all of the animals. Um, right now, the giant panda, I'm sure many of you have seen this, or um, maybe you've seen it in real life. But the giant panda right now, just so you guys know, there's about 1,600 left in the wild. That's it. So giant pandas are dying out. Um, last year was the first year in a long time where there was actually more pandas than before, before the population had continued to decrease. This is very sad. The other thing is, this is the mountain gorilla. It's found in DRC Congo. And right now, there are only around 700 left in the wild. Um, so also very, very sad. This is my favorite animal. It's called the Amur leopard. It's found in Siberia, China, and Russia. And uh, right now, there are only about 84 left. In, in the wild. So these animals are continually being pushed out by us and by resource extraction, um, by us using more and more and more resources for more and more consumption. And these are the issues that kind of exist for me. On a local level, in Dar es Salaam, Dar es Salaam is the ninth fastest growing city in the world right now. Um, in 80 years, by 2100, Dar es Salaam will be the third most populous city in the world. And all the most populated cities will be in Africa. So Lagos in Nigeria will be the most populated. Number two will be Kinshasa in Congo. And number three will be Dar es Salaam. So this city will be the most populous city in the world. And also, the, one of the no city in the world is currently as populated as this city will be um, in 80 years. And today, the city produces a lot of waste. Um, it's ranked as the 12th dirtiest city in the world by some ranks. Um, and the city produces around 5,000 tons of waste per day. If you think that an elephant is six tons, that's around 833 elephants of trash. A uh, view of plastic bottles that you're using or the paper or the cardboard that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's a lot of waste that, uh, that we're throwing away, that we're creating every day. And that waste... Sometimes it goes to the rivers, sometimes it goes to the beaches, um, sometimes it comes back on the beaches. Uh, these are the issues that exist and will continue to exist 
as the population of Dar es Salaam grows. So the company I started a while ago is called The Recycler, and we do recycling and waste management for a lot of different uh, companies where we reduce the amount of waste um, by, through recycling. So right now, the different material we take is white paper and cardboard, which we make into tissue paper and envelopes. Glass goes back into glass. Cans and tins are made into different types of long metal. Um, plastic bottles are shredded, um, exported to India, where they're made into t-shirts and fibers. Um, so that's the, this is about reusing those kind of resources and finding ways to reduce the amount of resources that you need. The one thing you didn't see is food waste. Uh, food waste makes up about 40% of all the waste here. So we're throwing away lots of food, uh, and we wanted to find a solution for food waste. The problem is that when you throw food waste away into a landfill, it, it, when it decomposes, it releases methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. So it's very bad for, for the climate. Um, so we're trying to think, you know, how do we, how do we reduce food waste and also how do, what can we do with it? What can we use food waste for? At the same time, it kind of ties into this other issue, which is uh, animal agriculture. Essentially right now, every time, uh, who eats meat? Does everyone here eat meat? A lot of people, yeah? Yeah, so every time you eat meat, um, it takes a lot of food for that animal in order to make that meat, okay? So if you see, if you look at a cow, on average you need about seven kilograms of feed that, that could be fed to humans or whatever for one kilogram of, of beef out of that. With pork, it's about four kilograms to one. Chicken, it's two kilograms. So you need double the amount of feed to, for that chicken to, to eat for you to make one kilogram. Um, so 40% of all the food in the world is currently being fed to animals, not to humans. It goes to animals, and then some of us eat, eat the animals. Um, and a lot of that food is, is grains, um, and a lot of it, the most important part is protein. So if you look at the picture um, on the bottom there, uh, that is the growth of soybeans next to the Amazon rainforest. Um, what is happening is that we're, we're increasing uh, more and more soy, because we need more and more feed to feed to animals, and we're cutting down forests, and we're using more and more water and land and resources so that we can feed animals inefficiently so that they can feed some of us, right? At the same time, um, we're feeding them fish. So we're dragging out all the fish out of the, out of the ocean so we can feed animals so then they can feed us. Um, right now, more than 70% of the world's fisheries are fully exploited, overexploited, or significantly depleted. What this means is fish are running out. Um, we're running out of fish. So what our solution was is to try and find a way to use that food waste to feed the animals. And what we came up with were maggots. You guys can say ew, it's okay. <laughs> so these insects that we're using right now um, eat the food waste, and then we dry them out and we feed them to the chickens as a high protein content of feed. So they're taking the nutrients that are in that food waste, they're eating it, and then we take them and we dry them out. Should we show the video again? <laughs> um, let me click uh, play. So basically, we breed right now, we breed about six million of these guys a day in our factory. Um, and we've taken tons and tons of food waste. Um, these are our breeders. They're going to be turned into flies to make more babies, yeah? So our factory right now, uh, we're taking in tons of food waste. These insects are eating that food waste, and then we're drying them out as a high-protein feed for chickens. Does that make sense? You guys are all very giggly. Um, and luckily, the chickens, they absolutely love it. They will eat these all day, every day. Uh, chickens are all about these insects, um, and it also has a, a very good, it reduces pecking in chickens, uh, it reduces the need for antibiotics, um, and it's, instead of cutting down rainforests and feeding them soy, um, this is a kind of a new way to do it. Does that make sense? Now, I could also feed them to humans. So this is a, a woman in Austria who developed a, um, a breeding house at her own where you keep the flies in your house, you add a little food for them, they make the eggs, and then you add them to your salads or to your beans. Okay, fine, just chickens for now. But... Uh, <laughs> 
Um, and a, a part of all this is this kind of idea of zero waste. Um, zero waste is kind of a utopian idea is, what if we didn't make any waste? What if we didn't need to have waste at all, and we could use our resources over and over again? And so the biggest culprit of this is kind of this idea of packaging. So everything you buy is in packaging. And only 7% of plastic is recycled in the world, on average, about 7%. So every time you open a, some Oreos or some cookies or any of these things, you have packaging that is then discarded immediately. So we're trying to do a lot of thoughts around how can you reduce the amount of packaging that exists. Um, so this woman here, she, she's in New York, um, and she, that's, that's, she's holding her total amount of waste for two years. That's all the waste she's able to produce in two years. And she does that. Um, at the bottom corner, there's a zero-waste grocery store where essentially you buy everything in bulk, you bring your own containers, uh, you use those containers to, to fill up flour or sugar or any beans or nuts, and this reduces the amount of packaging that you need. So it's kind of a new way to think about it, and in many ways, it's what we used to do. I mean, plastic was invented in the 1920s, right? We didn't have plastic, and, and now there's more plastic in the ocean than fish by 2050, right? So. It's a huge, it's huge issue. In Tanzania, there are a lot of things that people do here. Um, it's very simple. Like you can go to the to the local market. You can fill up your sugar, your rice, your beans, all of these things in a bulk bag. You don't need to buy it in packages. Um, every time you drink a Coca-Cola, or which you shouldn't, because they're very bad for you. But every time <laughs> you drink a Coca-Cola or something like that, um, that Coca-Cola bottle isn't recycled. It's actually reused. It goes back to the factory where it is washed out and is reused, which is better than recycling, because if you recycle it, you have to heat it up to 2,000 degrees, you have to melt it, and all of that uses energy, right? So it's about, it's almost anti-recycling in that case. And then people also, they are using banana leaves to wrap fruit um, instead of plastic, and this, this can be thrown away um, and, you know, can be composted. So at my house, we get our own cloth bags, we get our own containers, we bring them to the, the local grocery markets or to the markets, and we, we reduce our packaging as much as possible. We're not perfect. We, we definitely still have some packaging. I like Pringles, but uh, you know, there are things like that that, can, that, that you can reduce in, in different ways. The last thing I want to talk about is straws. So if you don't remember anything I told you tonight, remember this about straws, okay? So essentially, Every straw starts out, you know, it's, it's taken from the ground as, as oil. It's like shipped halfway across the world. It's made into something, and then you drink it for like less than five minutes, and then immediately you throw it away, right? So this is like one, and it's the like number one cause of ocean debris is straws. Um, it's, they can't be recycled. They're very difficult to recycle. And so every time you use a straw, it's just pointless. You guys, we all have lips. You can drink out of lips. You don't need to use a straw. Um, and this will reduce the amount of waste you use over your lifetime. Yeah? So I told you all these things because this is the, this is the purpose that I chose that makes me happy. And this is how, how I am, you know, going forward to, to make a difference in the world and to, to be happy and to be part of the community. So you guys need to think, you know, what, what makes you happy? Choose a purpose um, to be happy and to, to change the world. That's it. Thanks. Don't know what to do. Mr. Haddon, will you be accepting questions? Sure. Yes. She asked me what brought me to Tanzania. Uh, originally, I came here to work with the United Nations. I worked with refugees. Um, so I did that for the first time. Did that for about a year. I got really bored and I decided to start a business. But it was a good experience, um, just not, not for me. <laughs> yeah, next question. What was your, what gave you the idea to be the first recycler in Dar? Say again? What gave you the idea to be the first recycler in Dar? Um, thanks. Uh, I guess, I mean, there's just a lot of waste that was being thrown away. And uh, the good thing about recycling is it's, it's one of those ways that if you create a business, and it, it, you can make jobs from nothing. Um, sometimes you create a business and you, you make jobs, but your competitors... Um, you're kind of taking jobs in some ways, but with recycling, it's like you're making, you're creating jobs 
from, from something that would have been thrown away. So it's like an additional benefit. And so I was looking for areas where one, were good for the environment, but also that, that kind of would create jobs um, for local Tanzanians in, in that way. So that kind of fit both of the, both of the criteria, I guess. Go ahead. Uh, she asked me, how long have I been doing this? Uh, I've been in Tanzania for six years, so I've been doing this for, for five years. Um, the Maggot company is about three years old. We did uh, a lot of uh, research and development. We really struggled to get the insects to, ha to mate, to have sex and make enough babies. It took us a long time to get that right, um, but now they're, they're making plenty. <laughs> All right, who, who, let's go here. Do you plan on expanding outside of DAR, and what other future plans do you have for this company? She asked if I plan on expanding outside of DAR. Um, luckily, we're putting our, our first maggot factory in Kenya this year, in, uh, in March. Um, we're also doing a breeding facility in Nairo uh, sorry, in Addis Ababa, in Ethiopia. Um, so we're trying to take our factory model, which has taken us a long time to get right, and put it. we want to put it in almost every country in East Africa. Um, the weather matters a bit. Uh, our insects, they prefer 27 degrees Celsius. They're very fussy about that. Um, so we need to either heat up the room or find ways to, to, to breed them at those temperatures. Um, so, but Mombasa is where we're going in, in Kenya, which is the same temperature as here. Yeah? Say again. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, he asked, since I started the company, do I see a decrease in recycling in Dar es Salaam? Yes, I mean, the good thing is that when people see, so I mean, we are recycling lots of waste, so, so that's definitely an increase. Um, but also, you know, we've made a lot of noise about it, and, uh, and I've seen other companies that have started recently that are also doing recycling, and um, I mean, they're competitors to me, so I don't love it. But it's definitely great that, uh, that they're also doing it, right? So um, we've seen kind of like a cascade of, of other companies joining in. Um, and overall, the, the environment uh, for that is very great. So yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm going to come down. <laughs> she asked where I got the funding for the project. So for the recycling company, uh, I didn't have any money when I started. Um, I just, bought, I just had, had enough money to buy one truck. Um, and so I started with just one truck, um, and that was that was it. So I didn't get any, I didn't raise any funding. Um, but for the insect company, we were able to secure grant funding, and we raised about 1.3 million dollars. Um, so it's a lot of money. But remember, money doesn't make you happy, guys. Um, also, I don't get to see any of that. But yeah, so uh, <laughs> basically, we we had to do so much research and development over the period um, that that we raised some grant funding to, to do that research and development and now to, to scale it up on, on a big scale. Um, so after, it's easier to raise money after you establish something and people can say, okay, this is what your financials are, this is what things look like, um, so then you can raise money off of that back. Go ahead. Is the, ma Sorry. Is, is the concept of maggot farming spreading? Like, is that something as you see that's going across the world? And also like bulk buying, because I know a lot of places where I live, I would love to buy in bulk and bring my own container, but they don't offer that. So I mean, do you see it as something from your point of view that's, that is spreading a little yeah. bit or? Yeah, good question. It's kind of hard to see, because like when you, get, when you start to get involved in these things, like you kind of like lose your, I mean like, so to me it's like, yes, everybody's using maggots now, right? Because I see, I see all, I know all the companies that are doing maggots and I see this on a kind of continual basis and same with, with uh, bulk buying of zero waste because I see all the companies that are coming up. So I, it's hard to distance myself from some what is, from what is real, what is the real world and, and what is not. Um, but yeah, I mean, there is a company uh, that just raised $120 million for, for insects. Um, there are new companies popping up for zero waste even in South Africa. Um, I've seen in New York and DC and Germany. Um, so I definitely think this is increasing and it's going to keep going. Um, I think that insect feed will be the future of, of, the, of the feed industry. Um, it's just going to take time.
to, to get it right um, and to do it on a big scale. Yeah? I'm going to go over here again. Someone had a mic that had a question? No? Yeah, go ahead. How did I come up with the idea of maggots? The truth of the matter is I didn't. Uh, basically, my business partner, a guy named Keegan, he, he was doing these in his backyard. And so I had the recycling company. And uh, he's like, yeah, I'm growing these insects in my backyard out of my waste. I think we can do something with them. And so he contacted me, and then we, we joined together on that. So it was completely his idea. Um, so yeah, I thought it was pretty gross at first. <laughs> Anyone? Else? Go ahead. He asked me what percentage of the city's waste is being recycled. Um, that's a tough question. I'm, I'm gonna. I'd, it's gonna have to be an estimate. So one thing I'll say is that, um, for example, like plastic bottles. Uh, there's a very good market for plastic bottles in Dar es Salaam. Uh, you'll see people all across Dar es Salaam collecting plastic bottles, um, putting them in bags, and then selling them to various companies. Um, so I, I would say that you know, when it comes to plastic bottles, we probably have a better recycling rate than like Sweden. Because every, if you go to the dump site, every plastic bottle you see there is being collected. Because you get 300 shillings per kilo per, so it's not a lot of money, but there are people that, that that they can make around 2,000 shillings a day and have no other options, and they, they do it, right? So plastic bottle, we probably recycle a lot of that. Um, but the, then there's glass, which has almost a very small value. There's um, different types of paper whose value is very small. Uh, lots of other items. I mean, most plastic, besides plastic bottles, there is no market for whatsoever. Uh, plastic bags, there's no market for. Um, so these things aren't being recycled at all. So if I had to like just guess, what percentage of waste would be recycled? I'd probably say that maybe 20% is being, being recycled, more or less, um, because the majority of the waste is actually food waste. So 40% of the waste is food waste, and that's not being recycled in any meaningful fashion except for, for our maggot factory. Go way over there. Um, I had two questions for you. So the first question is about your, the feeding the chickens with the insects, right? Sure. You said that, you mentioned three different animals. You mentioned uh, the cow, the pig, and I think the chicken. So yeah. What are, so sure, you're helping the chicken. What about the cows? Yeah. And yeah, don't, don't, eat the, don't eat the cows. Okay, guys? Knock it off. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Um, yeah, so essentially, uh, I mean, there, there are new ways that people are trying to do in, in livestock breeding, specifically with, uh, with cows. So technically, you could feed. Our, 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 our insect protein has been used with pigs um, very, very effectively. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of research on cows. Um, so, I mean, also red meat is very bad for you guys. <laughs> um, so yeah, all, all of those things uh, are issues that exist. Um, we, the main two things that we are focused on is chickens and then also fish. So we will be doing aquaculture, so making fish and feeding uh, those fish um, are insects instead of, instead of fish. But uh, you guys, you know, there's plenty of room to be entrepreneurs and find ways to make better solutions for, for cows and pigs. Go ahead, follow-up um, question. So the second question was, so you, you discourage the use of, use of straws, right? Um, so let's say, hypothetically speaking, right, everybody stops using straws, right? But then the factory has already made like tons of straws. Don't you think like maybe all of them are just gonna end up in the ocean again? Okay. So she asked, she said, you told me to stop using straws, but the factory already made straws. So the good thing, there aren't a lot of good things about the capitalist system, but one of the good things about it is that it's supply and demand. So yes, the factory makes, makes a lot of straws because the demand is high. Every straw that you don't take lowers the demand of that, right? So what it means is that, sure, there are lots of those straws now, but they're probably producing millions of straws a day because that is what the demand is. The demand will re reduce as people stop using straws, just like the demand for many different things reduces when you stop doing it. So every, so even though like, yes, on, on, if you think of it on like, a, on like your individual impact, it's eventually your demand will make a difference on the long steam because they won't, they won't be able to sell as many straws and so they'll start m stop making as many. Does that make sense? It's very, it's very similar, like, it, it's a very proven economics type of thing. 
Any other questions? You've already asked one. Let's go over here. Yeah, talk to me. Hit me. Sure. How much food waste do we process? And the second question? Yeah. Sure. Okay, so the first question is how much food? So we're taking about two tons a day right now of food waste. Um, so that's like a big truck a day of food waste. Um, when we're at full scale, we want to be doing about 20 tons a day. Um, and we're hoping to hit that by June this year. Um, so it's a, it's a lot. It's a decent amount. It's the amount that for a market or like we take all the food waste from Serena Hotel and a, a few other places. Um, we're starting to work with expired foods as well with the port. Um, but there will be a point where we'll need as much food as possible. But still, there's lots of food waste here. The second question is, is fish. Um, so basically, there, so there are two types of fish. There's the wild fish that they catch from the ocean, right? You guys following? And then there's also aquaculture fish. Um, and a lot of people see aquaculture fish as a solution for, for reducing the, the overfishing in the oceans. The problem is that you feed fish, <laughs> wild fish, to the aquaculture fish. So basically, you need it for salmon, you need about two kilograms, just like chicken, of, of fish, of wild fish, to feed the salmon. So you're not actually helping. You're, you're actually taking out more fish than you would be if they were in, in the ocean because you're feeding them on a concentrated level. So what we'll do is, instead of feeding them fish, you'll feed them insects. So this will reduce the amount of fish that you have to take out from the ocean um, so that hopefully that they can, they can breed more and there can be more baby fish and baby fish can grow up. Yeah? Is this boring yet? Who's asleep? <laughs> uh, you guys, just a quick announcement. Um, we're just going to, like, we're, we're going around giving you guys microphones so everyone can hear your questions. So, um, yeah. All right, go ahead. Round two for you. Um, uh, what are you doing to raise awareness about recycling in the rural areas? Sorry, say again? She asked me, what am I doing to raise awareness about recycling in the rural areas of Tanzania? Well, luckily, well, not luckily, but in the rural areas, use a lot less waste than we do. Um, you know, you use about as much waste as your income is. So. The rural areas, if you, if you go to most of the rural areas, the only waste that they really have is food waste, and the, that food waste isn't actually going to the dump site. It's going to be thrown in their backyard as compost. Um, so the real problem isn't the rural areas. It isn't the, the people, it, it, actually, it's not even people in Africa. The, the biggest uses of waste are people in America and Europe, um, people who are wealthy and affluent. Um, those are the people that produce them out. I mean, the average person in Africa produces about you know, half a kilo a day. The average person in America produces like three kilos a day. So there's a, just a, a vast difference between those. Uh, but that's a good question. I mean, um, how do we, the problem is that it's transport. Recycling specifically is a very low value item. It's, a, it's about getting the cost down as much as possible. So it's really hard to get recyclables or plastic bottles from, from the rural areas. Um, but they also reuse a lot, unlike, unlike people here where we just throw away, yeah? So, working on it, maybe you can do something. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Here it comes, wait for the mic. Do you plan on opening a recycling plantation where people can just take their recycling and... Yeah. Do I plan on opening, uh, yeah, so we have a couple of collection points now. Uh, for instance, you can take your recyclables here, there's a collection point right outside here by the fields um, that anyone can bring their recyclables at any time. Um, I hope they're still telling you about this. Um, we also have a few other collection points in different different locations in, in Tanzania. Um, so yeah, so we're doing that in that way. Um, we're, we're trying to make it easier and easier. And uh, other, a couple other companies are also starting more public uh, collection points. So there should be more and more of these. But all, the, all your glass, all your paper, cardboard, cans and tins you can bring to the school um, you can put it in the bins they have marked, and uh, it'll, it will, we collect it here, so we'll recycle it. 
¿Ya? Boom, boom. Out of questions, huh? Oh, um, I wanted to ask. Um, so, if we have things like toothbrushes and like deodorant, that's like all, that's like all plastic. But then, how can how great can question? You, like, recycle that kind so of stop, stuff? stop wearing deodorant, all of you guys. No, I'm kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> um, so basically, so the, the the new the kind of different ways of uh, of toothbrushes is um, so I don't know if this is a gimmick or if it's actually useful, but um, so I have like a bamboo toothbrush. So the idea with a bamboo toothbrush is that um, you use it, and then when you're done using it, you, it can compost. Um, so the reason compost makes sense is because if you take food waste or these things and you throw them in a dump site, that has no air. And the air, that, that's how it produces methane. But if you're in a compost system, it doesn't produce methane. So it's actually not, it's, it can break down normally just fine. Um, so that's why composting is a good way. So we have like bamboo toothbrushes in our house. Um, but yeah, like, like I said, you can't be perfect. Um, no one is. Um, but there are many of these solutions. If you go to Zero Waste Home, um, she breaks down every item that she uses um, to get you an idea of how you can replace it. Um, for, for deodorant, she uses bicarbonate soda. So uh, apparently bicarbonate soda, you can rub on your armpits and it'll make you not smell. And so then she buys the bicarbonate soda in bulk and reduces that. I tried it, I didn't like it. <laughs> But, uh, but, there, so, but there are hundreds of these different solutions um, that you can, you can look up to get rid of plastic on a day-to-day on -day -day basis. Yeah? Good? Because toothbrushes aren't going to be recycled. Anything that's small, it's not going to be worth recycling because it's just too tiny. Yeah. Like straws. <laughs> cool? Is that it? Thanks. Okay, so real quickly, um, breakfast is being set up right now. It's not really ready, so we're just going to hang out in here for a little bit. Also, during breakfast time, um, I want you guys to go back onto the website and double check if you have a workshop session because that's going to happen later today. So from 11 to 11.20, um, the first session for workshops on day two, you guys have preparation time. Um, right after breakfast, there's going to be a global village meeting. So after breakfast, please go to the courtyard and you'll be put into your global villages. Thank you.